Have you ever been caught out in a storm when you weren't expecting it? When I was growing up, we spent a lot of time on a small fishing boat uh, on inland lakes, but then also occasionally on Lake Michigan. And we always had to watch the weather really closely when we were going out on Lake Michigan because it really wasn't built for a lake of that size. And so we're out there one day, and uh, the weather's starting to turn. We're keeping our eye on it, but the fish were biting, so we were staying out there. And uh, all of a sudden, the storm that we could see off in the distance was right on top of us. And it was time to go in. And as we looked at the dock, there was another boat there that was getting ready to go out. So we're, we had to wait our turn. And during that waiting period, the storm came in in full force. And so now we're getting tossed around on our small fishing boat on Lake Michigan uh, in, in Glen Arbor. And it was just, it was a little bit intense. Uh, we got up to the dock and the, the waves were crashing the boat into the side of the dock. And we're trying to keep the boat steady, get it up on the trailer um, to avoid having to beach it, which we probably should have done. And uh, our friend who was with us is me, me and my dad and my dad's friend. Uh, my dad's friend, George, falls into Lake Michigan. And it was freezing. It was a frigid fall day. He falls into Lake Michigan. Now, this was around the period of time where Gore-Tex was kind of new technology. And he had this full Gore-Tex fishing outfit. He pops up out of the water after being completely submerged. He goes, okay, I'm wearing Gore-Tex. You know, I'm fine. And fortunately, nothing negative happened to him after that. He just had to dry out. Uh, but it was a pretty intense day. It was a pretty intense day out on the lake. Maybe you've been caught out in a storm one thing I know for sure is that you've been caught in a storm of life, just those unexpected things that come our way. And that's where Jonah finds himself in this morning's passage. I'm going to read it again. Jackie read it for us earlier. I'm going to read it again as we work our way through. It says, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest upon the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. So it, th this image is that God has deliberately caused this storm, right? He hurled this storm, it's the same word someone might use for like throwing a spear. He hurled this storm upon the sea. And now the ship is threatening to break up. In verse 5 it says, Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. And so the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call on your God, perhaps the God will give, us a, give a thought to us that we may not perish. Jonah finds himself in the midst of a storm. And again, this is a storm that God has sent to pursue him. And sometimes we look at this, we're like, wow, this is, God's punishing him. God's chasing after him. But you, I, I think about what my coaches all used to say when I was growing up playing on sports teams. They would always say to the players, they would always say to the team, hey, don't worry about it when the coach, when we as coaches are going after you and telling you and correcting you and telling you, no, that wasn't right. You have to do it this way. You should start worrying when we stop doing that. Because that means we don't care about your improvement because you're not going to contribute to the team. You're not going to play. But as long as we're correcting you and we're getting after you, that means we believe that you can be a contributor to the team. And so in a sense, it's like we, we need to be more uh, fearful of God not pursuing us than him pursuing us. And in this moment, that's what God is doing with Jonah. He is relentlessly pursuing Jonah. And we've talked about this. This book is ultimately, the book of Jonah, we think of being about a whale or a fish. It's not about a whale or a fish. It's about God's relentless pursuit of his people. And, and here we see he's relentlessly pursuing Jonah. Here's the reality about li life, okay? Excuse my voice. I was at a very loud wedding last night, and I had to project the entire night. I had no idea I was losing my voice. Um, but here's what we find out about God. Here's what we, we find out about life, actually, ultimately, is that everybody faces storms. Everybody faces storms. You will face storms in life. I will face storms in life. We all are going to face troubles. We're all going to face trials and difficult times. Jesus promised us as much in John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. There are all sorts of different types of troubles that we will face in this world, in this life. This, this boat that Jonah's on right now, as he's trying to escape and flee from God, this boat that he is on is acting as his functional savior. He is putting his trust in this boat instead of in God. He's using this to get him away from the call that he does not want to obey. He's using this boat as a functional savior. And this passage says that the sea, the tempest, the, the ship is threatening to break up because of what God has sent upon this ship. 
this storm that he's sent to get Jonah's attention. It's threatening to break up. Sometimes God needs to break up our, our functional saviors. He needs to break up the things that we're putting our trust in above him. He needs to break up the things that we're using to take us away from him. And he does that out of love for us, out of relentless pursuit toward us. And that's what he's doing here. He's threatening to break up this thing that Jonah is putting his faith and trust in. And we should want that. If we're putting our faith and trust in something other than God, it's counterfeit. It's less than, and we should want God to come in and break. It's a scary prayer to say, God, break up all of my idols. Break up those things that I'm trusting in besides you. It's a scary prayer to pray, but it's a meaningful one. It's a powerful one. It's one that we should be praying because even though it would be painful, even though it might be painful for him to come in and break up our idols, our areas where we're putting trust in something else, we need him to do that so he can have our whole hearts. We have the tendency to put our trust in a lot of things, maybe our finances, maybe relationships or careers or positions of power. It could be all, all sorts of different things that we might be putting our trust in, th things that are acting as a functional savior for us, but we should ask God to break those things up. Some trials that we might face in life, like Jonah's here, might be created by ourselves, might be created by the fact that we are, we are worshiping something else, we are trusting in something else. Not every, difficult, every difficulty, though, that we face is going to be the result of sin, right? Not every difficulty that we face is the result of sin. But every sin will bring you difficulty, right? This is, a, this is a point that Tim Keller makes in his book, The Prodigal Prophet. Absolutely amazing point. Just this idea of thinking, not every difficulty that we face is caused by our sin. But every time we sin, we cause difficulty on ourselves and other people. That's just how life works. We think about indifference towards, uh, like if you don't pay any attention um, to take, taking care of yourself in a health perspective, right? Well, what's going to happen? You're going to experience negative uh, symptoms because of that. You're, you're going to have issues with, with your physical health. Maybe you don't pay any attention uh, at your job. Like your, your job's not going to be going so well. Like when we, when we do things, they, one thing leads to another. There are consequences for choices and actions. And when we sin, when we run away from God, there are consequences to that. There are consequences that brings difficulty into our lives, and that's what Jonah's experiencing right now. Not every difficulty is a result of sin, but every sin is going to have its consequences. In Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, it says, If you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. When I was doing youth ministry, we used to have an annual summer retreat speaker, a guy named Brett, and he was just, he was awesome. He just really memorable ways of teaching to students. And he used, he used to give this talk every, every few years. He would give this talk. And I remember, I remember the entire point, like all three points of the message because he just gave it in such, delivered it in such an awesome and powerful way. He used to say, sin blinds you, sin binds you, and sin always finds you, right? And all these middle schoolers, we remember it. Middle school staff, middle school students will remember that for the rest of their lives because it, it rhymes, you know, and it gets simple and it's easy. But sin blinds you, sin binds you, and sin always finds you. What does that mean? Your sin will always find you out. We think we're getting away with something sometimes, but it, it has a way of circling back around. Here's what a great 18... Uh, 1800s preacher Charles Spurgeon, here's how he said it. He said, God never allows his children to sin successfully. <laughs> There's something that comes along after that as a result of that. In Proverbs, same exact phrase happens in chapter 22, verse 3 and 27, 12. It says, the prudent see danger and they take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. When we walk in a certain way, we end up reaping uh, the, the penalty, the consequences of walking in that way. And even Jesus said it in his own words in Matthew 26, verse 52. He said, put the sword back in its place. He says when, when Peter attacks with the sword when he's being arrested, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. You live by the sword, you die by the sword, right? You live in a certain way, you have a, a tendency for those things to come back on you. Liars tend to get lied to, right? Because of the way that they live out their lives. Cheaters tend to get cheated on. Like these things happen over and over. The way that our world says it, what goes around comes around, right? What goes around comes around. That, life has a way of that happening most of the time. That's, that's typically what happens. It's not, it's not like some kind of, you know, cosmic thing. It's, it's not coincidence. It's, it's when you walk logically in this way, you should expect something to come back that comes out of it in, in, that, in, that, same, in that same regard. But not all trials are the results of our sins. 
We think about the other characters involved in this scene. These other sailors who are on the ship, they're caught in Jonah's storm, right? They're caught in Jonah's storm, but it wasn't about them. That storm wasn't being sent for them, it was being sent for Jonah, but they get caught in it as well. Jonah's sin is impacting those who are close to him, in this case, just physically close to him. Oftentimes in our lives, our sin impacts those close to us, whether it's physically close to us or people who are closest to us in relationship. Our sin has impact on those around us. And some trials that we experience are going to be caused by us in our decisions. We might make a bad decision. You might do something you know you shouldn't do at work, and then, you know, you face a consequence. You might lose your job for that. Or maybe you lose your job, but it has nothing to do with something that your performance or anything that you did, some other uncontrolled factor. Maybe it's somebody else's mistake. So some trials are caused by us, some are caused by others, and some are just the result of living in a broken world. We face storms for all different types of reasons. We don't always know the reason, even as it happens. In, in the book of John, the, the New Testament gospel, covering the life of Jesus, uh, chapter 9, Jesus encounters this scene with his followers. It says, as he went along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Why was he born blind? And in, in their worldview, is basically something had to have caused this. This is some kind of penalty for something, whether it's him or his parents. Someone messed up. That's why he's blind. And, and Jesus says, says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Sometimes it's just brokenness of sin, and it's an opportunity for God actually to come through and to show his glory and to act for our good. He can use our trials for his glory and our good as we walk throughout life. And that's the second thing I want to point out is that every storm is an opportunity. Everyone's going to face storms. Everybody faces storms in life. And every storm that we face is an opportunity. Picking up on that same thought of, of Tim Keller from his book, The Prodigal Prophet, uh, not every sin, right, not, or not every uh, trial is caused by sin. All right, not every trial is a result of sin, but every trial can reduce the power of sin in our hearts. So let's just say we're facing a trial that's just the result of, or that wasn't caused by our sin. It's still an opportunity to grow, to move towards God. So when storms come, we have a chance to learn and grow and connect with God. We often end up at the other side of a storm or a trial with this perspective of, you know what, I would never want to go through that again. I hope I never have to go through something like that again. But I'm thankful that I did because of what I learned as a result. Ever heard somebody express that about a struggle that they went through? Maybe you've experienced that and that feeling yourself where it's like, no, I would never choose it. But if I had a time machine, I wouldn't change a thing because of how much I got out of that situation. We have to look at our storms as an opportunity, an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to reduce the power and the, the hold of sin in our lives, the opportunity to draw closer to our Lord. That's what our storms are. They're an opportunity to do all of those things. And here's where Jonah really messes up in the midst of this storm. All right? We, we see that, that he's continuing to rebel. He's continuing to run. Because there's, he's called twice. I believe one time directly by God and one time indirectly by God in the first chapter of this book. In Jonah chapter 1 verse 2, which we read earlier, um, as we read the whole first six verses, it said, God says to Jonah, arise, arise, and go to Nineveh. And then the second half of verse 6, the, the captain of the ship comes to Jonah and says, arise, call out to your God. Call out to your God. So he's being called, and when he's being called by God, directly or indirectly, I believe he's using a, a non-believer <laughs> to actually reach out to Jonah in that moment. But as God is calling out to Jonah, directly or indirectly, arise, he's calling him arise each time, arise and, and go, arise and call on God, right? But here's what Jonah does in these situations. In verse 3, it says, Jonah rose, right? He rose, but not to, not to go to Nineveh. He rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And then, it, this is really interesting use of language. Then he went down to Joppa. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fee, and what does he do? He went down again to get on the boat. So God's calling him to arise, and the author is writing this, is making it very clear. God's calling him up, and he keeps going down, right? 
He calls him to go up, and he keeps going down. He rises to flee, but then he goes down to Joppa, and he goes down into the boat away from the presence of the Lord. And then in verse 5, it says once again, this is how we know that the sleep is a part of his rebellion. We don't know it from the text itself, except that the author leaves this little hint for us, right? He leaves this little hint for us because he says, Jonah had gone down again. He went down again. This time he went down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. Jonah's running. He's being passive. He's, he's, he's neglecting his duty as a prophet. He's neglecting his duty as a follower of God because as God's calling him to arise, he keeps going down, right? And sometimes we do that. We get into trials, we get into storms, and these storms are an opportunity for us to draw closer to him. And so often when we face these storms, we run. Instead of arise, we go down. We disappear. We hide away as far away from God as we feel like we can get. And we need to remember when we're going through those times. That's when we need him. That's when we need him the most. And he comes through for us. Next time you're facing a trial or or a storm, if you're facing one right now, stop running. Turn to him. Turn to his community, too, of followers, of believers, to lift you up and draw you closer to him. Jonah's sleep was part of his attempt to escape. And instead of him teaching these, this group of non-believers about who God is and how powerful his God is, God has to teach them that lesson in spite of Jonah, which we'll look at more next week. Even when God sent the storm, Jonah did not turn to him on his own. But every storm can be an opportunity. We see that it's consistent throughout the scripture. Brother Jesus, James, wrote a book in the New Testament. In chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God can use the storms and the trials, regardless of their cause, regardless of their origin. Most of the time, we don't know why they come. Uh, Most of the time, they're just a result of living in a broken world, and that's it. It's as simple as that. But when we face those storms, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity. And my encouragement this morning as we we look at these storms that we go through in life is just simply to seek God in your storms. Seek God in your storms. It's a time when you go through a trial, when you go through a storm, it's a time to stop. It's an opportunity to stop. And make sure you do that. Stop and say, what what do I need to learn here? How can I focus on God? And it's not that this came because you have to learn something. This isn't caused so that you, don't worry about the cause or the why so much as what it is that you can do, what you, you can learn, and how you can grow through that period of time, through that difficulty that you're going through. Sometimes we get this idea that there's nothing good that can come from our storms, but that's just a lie. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. God can work all things for good in our lives as we walk with him. And not to mention, the best thing, the best thing that ever happened for you and for me, I believe this to my core, the best thing that ever happened to you and to me came out of suffering. It came out of suffering. Here's what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 53, a prophetic um, teaching in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, it says, but he, he eventually being Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. If we need a a proof of any kind that something good can come out of something terrible, it's through the cross of Jesus Christ. That he came and he suffered and he took on something horrible and ugly and filled with pain, and he did that to purchase life for you and for me. And then he gives us an opportunity to freely take hold of that, to freely receive that, and then to walk in him with a promise that whatever we go through, the good things and the bad things, that he will be by our side in those moments. And that is an amazing promise. It's a promise that brings life. It's a promise that we can depend on, that we can live by, that's going to be a sure foundation as we walk throughout our whole entire lives. So as we face storms, 
let's not look at them as purely evil and, and not, no opportunity for something good. But as we face storms and we're called to arise, let's make sure that we don't go down, but that we turn to him, that we seek God in the midst of our storms. And even as we think about Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus going through the greatest of storms on our behalf so that we could know him, I think it's a great opportunity for us to pause and to do this thing we've been doing for a couple thousand years as the church and take something we call communion. And communion is an opportunity for us as we, as we walk with the Lord and as we uh, reflect on what he's done for us, really the center of our faith to think about the symbolism of the elements that, that we were given for communion, the bread and the wine, or in our case, the juice, where we, we're symbolizing in those, in those elements the body and the blood of Jesus that he allowed to be broken and, and poured out for our sake, where something really, really great can happen out of something really, really awful, where God gives us that blessing. Here's what it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 19. And if you have your cup, we'll take this together this morning. Do communion in community. You can just peel the top layer to get to the wafer. Luke chapter 22, verse 19 says, And he took the bread... And he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When he says that, do this in remembrance of me, he's saying reflect on what I've done for you. And then also Paul challenges us to reflect on our own hearts as we pause to take communion. He calls us to reflect on our own hearts and what's going on inside of us. And so we pause, we think about our lives, we think about what he's done for us and we just thank him. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you, the blood of Jesus poured out for you. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you that as we take these elements that symbolize your body and your blood poured out for us and broken for us, that we can call on a Savior who longs for us to come home, a Savior who has pursued us relentlessly, even in our sin, even in our wandering, our active fleeing. Lord, that you came to our rescue when we didn't know we needed it, when we didn't deserve it, Lord, when we were going our own way. Lord, help us as we go through life, whether it's an up or a down period of our lives, that we help us to pursue you. Help us to not run from you, even though that's in our nature. Lord, help us to remember that you have our good in mind, even when it feels like nothing good can come out of a situation. You have, you have our good in mind. Lord God, we, we just pray that you would bless this time as we sing together your praises again, as we sing about how you are good to us and faithful to us, even in the difficult times. Lord, you walk by our side. You tell us we will face difficulty, but you walk through it with us. God, we love you and praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. like I invite you to stand or sit, whatever you feel comfortable with. We're going to close with just proclaiming that our Lord is faithful and he has been faithful. Sing this out. Oh, I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And oh, my dear, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life 
So my life you have been faithful So my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will see of the goodness You have led me through the fire And in darkness time You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God All my life so my life you have been faithful So my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am Goodness is running after, it's running after me Your goodness, your goodness is running after running after me oh your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down surrender now i give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me just sing this out all my life So my life you have been faithful Yes you have So my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh I will see of the goodness of God Oh, I will see of the goodness of God. Amen. Yes, thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. You are so good. Lord, thank you that in, in the hardest of times we can lean on you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that, just to lean into you. Lord, for so much of life, we are either in a difficult time or coming out of one or going into one. And Lord, I just pray for every person here in this room, every person who listens to this later, that God, you would, oh Lord, that you would just walk with us, Lord, as we go in and out of those trial periods. That Lord, you would teach us, that you would comfort us, that your presence would be made known to us, that you would help us, Lord, to seek you in the storm. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. We will see you back next week.